Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Lazarczak, and I'm a developer at Chariot Solutions. Who could forget the 1999 Disney Channel original movie, Smart House? Well, if you did forget about it or just haven't seen it, the gist is a family gets a smart house outfitted with AI that eventually turns against them and locks them in the house. Spoiler alert, they make it out fine. Apologies if this was on your to-watch list, but the movie is over 20 years old now, which feels to me like fair game for spoilers. Uh, just because we don't have to worry about a smart house style AI takeover just yet doesn't mean that building out the systems and infrastructure to support actual smart homes doesn't present its own challenges. Our next presenter will take us on a deep dive into the challenges and architectural considerations required to build a highly secure, responsive, and scalable IoT cloud connecting a million or more smart homes. For our final talk of ETE, we are going to hear from Chief Systems Architect at Lutron Electronics, Christopher Oster. And before I hand things over to Chris, I just want to say big, big thanks to you, all the speakers, uh, sponsors, uh, everyone watching remotely. Uh, this actually has been a really good time, and I, I feel like it turned out better than uh, any of us really expected. And I'm just, you know, it's unfortunate we couldn't meet in person, but I'm, I'm at least very glad we can do this. So thank you to everybody. It's been a great time. And uh, hand it over to Christopher for our final talk. Great. Thanks, Jack. And all the folks out there, thank you for joining us, uh, especially given that this is the last talk of the session, uh, last talk of the, the event. And I saw we had a, a nice list of people joining, even though we are kind of right at the end here. So definitely appreciate that and hope you've had a great event so far. Um, I'm going to share a, a little bit about um, my company, Lutron, about myself, and then dig in a bit more to the technology we're using to build uh, what I think is a really cool um, High, highly capable, highly uh, performant IoT cloud to support our smart systems business. Uh, in general, um, I'll start just by giving you a bit, bit of my own background, and then I will give you a bit of background on the company, and then we'll dig into the tech. Um, we're going to leave plenty of time at the end for questions, so feel free to start dropping those into the Slack channel. So about me, um, I've been a software developer, a software architect, and a team lead in kind of high-tech industries for the last 16 or so years. Uh, I started out with my BS and MS in computer science at Penn State. Um, I joined Lockheed Martin and King of Prussia right after graduating from my master's degree, and I spent 15 years there building software-intensive systems for the defense and intelligence community. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, give or take, I, I left Lockheed uh, and joined Lutron to become the chief software architect at the company, uh, focused on primarily our smart building products. And I'm going to give you a lot more background about what we build. Um, but in my time, I, I've spent time building everything from sort of command control systems that power spacecraft to data processing systems that can process imagery uh, to embedded software that, that keeps spacecraft uh, in, our orbit, in orbit and doing their mission. And since I've joined Lutron, again, I sp spent my time focused on both cloud and embedded technology technology because we really build software sort of top to bottom across the enterprise. Um, you know, outside of my, my work life, I've spent a lot of time uh, contributing to industry projects, uh, a lot in the systems engineering realm. Um, so you'll see kind of a couple uh, highlights here uh, through groups like Incozy. Um, I tried my hand at getting a PhD, though I, I didn't quite finish. So I, I call myself a PhD dropout. I have all the dissertation um, with a master's of philosophy and system engineering from Stevens. And I have a couple of books out there on system engineering and software and so systems architecture practices. Um, now a bit more about, about Lutron. So Lutron is a, a really interesting company that, uh, especially given this is a Philly-centric conference, is really uh, relevant to folks who live in Pennsylvania. Uh, Lutron uh, was founded in 1961 by Joel Spira, who invented the solid-state dimmer switch. So, you know, think back to all of your parents' homes or even maybe your homes today, that little rotary knob that you can turn to dim your lights, that was Joel's uh, initial uh, innovation, and that really uh, drove the company forward. Um, he was working in the 50s uh, as a, an aerospace and defense researcher uh, working for the Navy. And basically he realized while he was doing some, some um, solid state electronics work that the device he was building uh, for another purpose could dim lights. And he saw the innovation, the opportunity to go create a residential product with that. And you'll see kind of on that, that left-hand side some of the early marketing that, uh, that Lutron put out. Really what I think is interesting is that right from the get-go, uh, Lutron was focused on the experience that they were providing their end users. And that's really been the foundation of the company kind of moving forward. Now today, our company is a lot different. We don't just offer that solid state, you know, uh, in-wall dimmer, though certainly we still sell that. We still sell a ton of that actually, and that's available through Home Depot and other, you know, retailers like Lowe's, Amazon.com and so forth. But a lot of our, our, our engineering innovation is focused on smart homes and smart buildings. 
um, residentially, and you'll see this in the top two pictures here, we offer a range of systems that uh, start with our, our mid-market Caseta line, which is a, a smart home technology that you know folks like myself and, and many of us on this call could afford. Um, but we also kind of have systems that range all the way up to what we call our homework solution, which is our really high-end solution. Uh, lots more uh, capability, uh, a lot more aesthetics, uh, finishes, uh, and stuff like that, uh, which we sell into you know properties that you might expect to find you know uh, someone like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos owning. In fact, I think both of them have our products in their home. Uh, but similarly, we have a commercial offering that uh, allows us to kind of offer solutions that range from I'll say simple energy uh, savings and code compliance up through the architectural lighting that you might expect in some really high-end spaces. Um, and so you'll see sort of examples here again that in the commercial space we offer a very similar product line to what we offer in the residence, but their, their focus is a bit different. Our Vive system is uh, a smart building system that's really focused on ease of install, ease of retrofit, and the ability to uh, drive down the cost of energy in a, in a professional space. Whereas our, our quantum system, which is our real, you know, all the frills, all the bells and whistles system, uh, it powers all sorts of really cool uh, uh, properties uh, around the world, including, for example, um, you know, right here in Philadelphia, we have our systems in the Camden Aquarium, the Philadelphia Zoo. And actually, there's a really cool article recently that uh, I'll drop into the Slack channel, where it talks about uh, the, the re, the re um, implementation of the Statue of Liberty torch, and that's being controlled by uh, a Lutron control system as well. And so we, we have a, a range of smart systems, and I'm going to dig into what that really looks like for our products. But again, a range of systems that range in size and complexity and capability, um, you know, across our residential and commercial portfolios. And above and beyond the, the control system side of things, which is really where Lutron got started, we have uh, a number of new things we've, we've brought in through, uh, through acquisition. Uh, one is the Ketra lighting uh, um, fixture uh, and, and, and lighting source. You think about uh, really high-end LEDs these days, think about the color control you get with a Philips Hue, but imagine the, the, the cream of the crop, the, the Cadillac of those, those technologies, uh, and that's what Ketra is. Ketra is uh, able to be individually addressable at the bulb level. Uh, it's dimmable down to 0.1%. It gives the, the widest um, color, uh, what's called CCT range and full color spectrum on the market. It's also a uh, four channel, uh, four color channels lets us do basically this really cool thing where we can enhance the saturation of colors. And it's really popular in museum applications and other, other high end spaces. So we've added that to our, our product mix as a native capability in our homework system. And we've also expanded to the outdoors where we have smart control systems for parking garages, uh, parking lots, outdoor spaces, where we can using this, um, we call the Lutron Limelight system, uh, generate a mesh uh, communication structure that can stretch a mile uh, outdoors. But let me jump back now to the problem at hand, uh, building a really cool uh, smart home system, a really, a really highly performant smart home system. What we see the problem really being is that we're competing first and foremost with the light switch. Sure, there are lots of other smart home providers out there. We have to compete with them as well. But ultimately, in people's homes, there are a lot more homes that have just a light switch than have any of our competitors' products. The light switches are reliable, they're simple, and they're cheap, and they work for a very long time. But we have a set of features that we really want to make sure we can we can lead with that give our, our customers a lot of value. And so on the left-hand side, I sort of just list out the, the set of features we offer in our homework solution. Um, and you'll see there's a whole lot of stuff, but we want it to feel as simple to use and have the same performance as that light switch on the right-hand side. And that's really with the way I see our, our company's um, focus and our offerings that how do we boil down a ton of capability for a smart home into a, a finished, polished, simple and reliable system capability. And that has to be both you know, working locally within the home as well as uh, being able available remotely, which is what is sort of expected from a smart home system. Now, I'm not going to dig into every one of these little little uh, dots here on this bullet chart. I'll cover them over, over the course of the talk. But basically, I'll just highlight a few things that we offer. We offer uh, certainly the smart dimming capabilities that, that Lutron is sort of known for. Uh, we offer smart shades uh, ranging from uh, wood shades, which I have in this office in front of me, uh, that are motorized and connected to my smart home. Uh, we offer roller shades. We offer Venetian blinds. We offer curtains, uh, all sorts of, of customized, fully, fully custom, fully um, fitted out uh, shades solutions. We offer sensors, uh, occupancy, daylighting, um, that type of stuff. And we offer a, a full range of aesthetics for controls, keypads, um, Pico remotes that are little um, 
little remotes you can control your lights or your shades with uh, remotely uh, with an RF signal. Uh, we offer uh, standard in-wall switches and so forth. All those pieces and parts have to come together to a cohesive system that just works. So what do people really want out of a smart home system that controls their lights? Well, I've kind of boiled it down to a few things here. And, and certainly you could probably add a ton of other things, but at the highest of high levels, people want, you know, first and foremost, things like app control. The whole reason you get uh, an internet connected system is because you want to control it when you're not home, right? You want to be able to schedule things, of course, and, and set, up, set up preferences, but then also have that kind of peace of mind of being able to control things and, and explore things when you're not in, the, in your space. So app control is a must. But really, at the end of the day, anyone that's going to build a smart home doesn't just want smart lighting. They want smart everything, right? Or, or at least a lot of other smart technologies. And so we have to really focus on integrations with many, many partners. Now, Lutron is, is a big player in the lighting business, but not necessarily a big player compared to, you know, folks like Amazon and Google, right? So we can't just assume that they'll come to us with integrations. We need to be proactive and really build out these, these opportunities for us to be part of a larger system. And you'll see on the list here some of the highlights. You know, certainly everyone expects the ability to integrate with Alexa and Google Home, right? But we also have a, a number of other integrations we find very useful that range based on our customer um, system types. So for example, we, you know, within the Philly area, we have uh, integrations with Xfinity Home. Uh, we also have a, a lot of integrations that are really getting popular in the, in the um, high-end space that, that sort of offer really, I'll say, more niche and custom integrations, like with uh, uh, a system called Josh AI, which is basically an Alexa for very high-end users. Um, we, we integrate with whole home control systems like Control 4 and Crestron, uh, as well as having your standard um, kind of uh, offering when it comes to smart home integrations, you know, Apple, Apple HomeKit, IFTTT, smart things, et cetera. But beyond the integrations, we also want to offer really what I think is like four main things to our customers. You know, first is peace of mind. You buy a, a lighting control system that's available on the internet so that you could have peace of mind to explore what's happening in your space. I want to be able to turn the lights on and off. I want to be able to potentially, uh, 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 integrate with my security system. Uh, that way, when the security system goes off, I have my lights to turn on. I want to be able to have something like Smart Away, a feature we offer where I can basically say I'm going to vacation mode and it's going to mimic real activity in the home to look like I'm home. Um, I want to have things like geofencing. So when I come home from work, my lights turn on. Those are kind of peace of mind features we think about for our users. I also want automation. Um, automation is a huge piece of what people want out of these systems. Um, so in the case of, of the room I'm in right now, I have, I have smart shades and they have a, a feature called natural light optimization. Basically throughout the day, it's going to automatically tilt my wood blinds to give me the, the right amount of light in my space so I don't have to worry about it. It's going to reduce glare. Uh, it's going to reduce fade of my furniture, but also give me as much light as I can get in the space without compromising the quality of my working area. Um, additionally, we, we see a lot of people really liking what we have called astronomic time clocks, where we can set events based on sunrise, sunset, uh, based on your location in the world. And um, we'll call coupled scenes, where I can have a scene in my Lutron system that's tied to either a button press on my wall, an app push of a, or an Alexa routine, which can kick off not just my lighting, but also my Sonos music preference, right? So think about that, you know, you certainly could do that in Amazon through the Alexa interface or Google Home interface, uh, if you're a Google user, but we also have that tied into our, our, our physical devices in the wall. So a keypad press can trigger those types of things. But all of that really has to come with a very clear focus on data privacy and data security and, and customer security. Now, ultimately, um, if you think about lighting as, and from a security point of view of just being, um, you know, attacked for using the lights, obviously that's, that's a very limited attack surface where people will say, well, you could be a vandal and, and make me uncomfortable in my home, certainly. But we also think about the fact that we don't want to be the, the entry point for someone to get into your home. We don't want to be the one that, that has failed and, and not protected your network unless someone pivot from us to someone else. And so we, we put a lot of focus on that security layer. And also we as a company don't really, um, we don't, we don't at all sell your data for, for any reason, right? So privacy has been a big part of what we offer, especially as we move up the, the market. Um, privacy is very expected. And so we, we take that very seriously as well in how we build our system. Okay, so I'm going to pivot a bit from just the what and the, and the who Lutron is into what we're building, and then we'll get into some of the deeper tech around, uh, around our system. Let me start with a very basic system, systems architecture for a smart home. And this will build out uh, over the course of a couple of clicks. So imagine that this is your house and you have uh, a couple of things in here that will be representative of everything we offer. So we have keypads, right? Those are on your wall. They're gonna be what you interface with when you're walking through your space. 
Uh, you're going to have some number of, of bulbs or controls that control lights. So those are represented by the bulbs, maybe some smart shades on some windows. And our systems all do uh, require and, and use a, a bridge. Um, and that's something that um, subsystems don't all require, and we have reasons for that, and I'll get into a bit. But um, you know, certainly we, we've considered not needing a bridge for our, our devices, but there is a lot of value we've seen from uh, the size and scale of systems we tend to build and deploy. So in our bridge case, our bridge connects to the internet, uh, connects to our IoT cloud, and um, you know, connects to your local router. And there, therefore, you know, via local Wi-Fi, you can connect to your um, to your device as well. Um, so what we do in the case of our app control here, you'll see that the mobile app can connect to the cloud as well. So if you're outside your home, it connects to the cloud and it will give you access to all the features we offer through our bridge. But we also have a direct channel through the local Wi-Fi. So if your internet's out, our system won't fail. That's a, again, part of that, um, that the level of service we expect for lighting. Um, once you've connected to that uh, bridge, you can now control scenes control schedules, program your system, uh, set individual light levels, interface with all of your different smart devices. Um, but we sort of build out from there. Now within the home, there's a lot of integrations that happen locally. Uh, so something like Apple HomeKit is not cloud to cloud connectivity. It is a local uh, network based protocol. And to be part of the Apple HomeKit system, you have to have some special capability on your, on your local bridge. Um, similarly, our integration with Sonos works locally in the home. So it doesn't require a cloud to cloud connectivity, which allows us to have you know, a totally offline mode for those integrations as well. And you'll see a number of other uh, uh, integrations I've highlighted here. So for example, the Control 4, the Crestron integrations, those are systems that we interface with that you know, offer things like um, in-home keypads, uh, kind of think about touch screen keypads to control a smart home. You know, and those will typically work within the local network and not, not leave the, uh, the, the home. Now I'm gonna kind of highlight a few things here. And of course I've, I've drawn some locks on these. Uh, I'm gonna step through a few of the examples of where we've kind of thought about security and I'm gonna get that more in depth uh, in a few slides. But you'll see of course locks on the interconnectivity. You know, everything we're doing between our device and our cloud is secured. Uh, you know, we have, and I'll get into a lot of more detail, but basically everything is gonna be uh, secured based on uh, first and foremost, um, everything's gonna be HTTPS of course, everything's SSL based. But at the end of the day, we also uh, focus on how we provision. Um, we have a secure provisioning uh, protocol that uses uh, uh, MTLS channel. And then once we connect those devices to the cloud that we're using um, our IoT providers, uh, secure communications uh, backplane. Um, in the home, you also see some, some locks. So in those, those bulbs, in the case of our Ketra system, uh, Ketra is using the thread protocol uh, locally within the home, which is a secured IoT uh, uh, Zigbee-like uh, communications protocol. Um, and that is, again, it's secured compared to our, a lot of the older protocols that were much more open. And so there's a, there's a whole setup of these bulbs to ensure that people can't hack into that system, you know, once they're in the home as well. Um, now, on the other side of the cloud uh, are the integrations that aren't in the home. Um, it really depends on, on what type of integrations you're talking about. Some are going to be cloud to cloud and some are going to be in the home. Those that are cloud to cloud, things like Alexa and Google, um, uh, we want to keep those secured as well. And those are all going to be secured via your traditional OAuth channels where you as a user get to authorize us and your Amazon account to talk to each other. And then finally, and this really comes in more in our high-end homes, you may have some third-party maintainers of your, of your smart home. So, you know, I'm, I'm the type of guy who's going to go open my wall up and install hardware myself, but um, a lot of folks who are on the higher end of the market um, really want someone else to do that. And so we want a way for those professionals that maintain a home to get insights into that home and do so in a secure way. So kind of basic, basic building block, you know, kind of diagram here. These are the kind of the main moving pieces we're going to talk about today as we dig in to our development. And again, the big focus here is going to be on this cloud block that's uh, powering a lot of this connectivity. So what is in an IoT cloud anyway? <laughs> what, what is the functionality you have to provide in that cloud? And I start with a couple of build outs as well. So first, uh, kind of can think about the life cycle of, of one of these systems. Um, let's say you go off and buy one of our Caseta systems, which I have in my home, and it's a great uh, uh, mass market option for smart home uh, technology or smart lighting technology. Uh, the first thing is when you out of box that system, you plug it in, you set it up on your in your internet, you have to basically have it connect to our cloud, and that's what our where our system provisioner comes in. Basically, the first thing our, our devices will do uh, is reach out uh, to a well defined um, DNS endpoint to say, "Hey, I'm new." What do I do? Um, our system provisioner service is um, MTLS channel, so mutual TLS. Uh, we use our, our device certs that are put on the device in, in manufacturing to authenticate against that endpoint. And we basically trace that back to the Lutron root CA. So we kind of know that it's one of our devices and you're not going to be able to easily uh, put a non-Lutron device on our cloud. 
Um, and then uh, once that kind of provisioning happens, you're, it basically what, what happens in there is that that device is then given um, an IoT address, a thing name, if you will, uh, and it's given a secure set of credentials and basically it's told how to connect to our cloud um, over MQTT. Uh, then, of course, also very important is our firmware management service. So that device probably needs to get updated. You know, it's it's been you know maybe on a shelf for a while. Maybe it's on the Amazon warehouse shelf. It may not have the latest firmware. Um, it'll then reach out and pull the latest firmware from a secure endpoint as well um, to update itself. Again, firmware assigned. It checks the signatures on on device, make sure it's a valid firmware image, and um, updates itself. Every time the device reboots, it'll check again with the provisioner, seeing if anything's changed. So if we wanted to, for example, you know, add a new endpoint for load balancing our cloud across, you know, across the world, uh, every time that system reboots, which will happen every time it updates the firmware or every time periodically uh, we have a time of timing sequence in there, it'll check for new new endpoints to go connect to. Now, center to this whole cloud is really what we, we have is the MQTT IoT device broker. Um, that broker is basically how traffic flows out of those IoT devices and into our cloud, and also how our uh, mobile apps can talk to our uh, to our devices when they're internet connected. That broker is is really uh, central to what we offer because it's the it's kind of the backplane that connects all of these you know hundreds of thousands and millions of devices to this cloud um, and does so securely and, and at scale. Uh, again, we'll talk uh, more of the technology selection there in a bit. Now, around that uh, uh, communications that that is sort of central to sending any command to the to those those smart homes, uh, we have two additional services I think are important to talk about. Um, one is we call the subscription management service, and that really helps us get data out to our third party uh, partners. So imagine that you have a, a smart home powered by Alexa. You want Alexa to know the status of your smart lighting system so that it can do its um, additional value add for that for that integration. And so in the case like Alexa or Google Home, we have to tell them when lights change level so they can show the, the right displays within their applications as well. Um, and that is this this component is, is really interesting because it's responsible for communicating that data, but doing so for only the systems that that have been integrated with with that third party and doing so in a, in a really you know high speed um, way. Uh, the system proxy service then is the kind of the reverse of that. If I want to send a command to that system and do so through a secure RESTful endpoint, that's what this offers. It gives us basically a secure, highly available proxy endpoint in the cloud for any connected Lutron system. It's kind of wrapping this all around. And I've kind of thinned this down a bit there. If I was trying to blow out every single service, we'd have a, you know, about a, about a dozen more here. But um, wrapping this all up is an integrated IM service. So basically um, providing consistent account management, authorization, policy management for, for our uh, integrations and, and system accesses. And then basically everything we're building, we have sort of a secure REST endpoint, um, well documented with OpenAPI for our integrators uh, so that we can have uh, sort of an easy path for integration to our systems. So again, these are the the really big building blocks that are part of an IoT cloud. Uh, again, if I were to go out to every single service we've built, you know, every every container, we'd have far more. But I think these give you the basic picture of what has to happen functionally within that cloud. Provision the system, keep the system up to date, talk to the system, uh, get data out of the system to the right places, you know, across the across the internet, and uh, do so securely uh, and make it easy for partners to integrate. And you know, with that, when I think about kind of key architectural drivers that we've we've thought about as we built out our cloud, it, it really comes down to these these five key key bullets. One is security. We don't want to be the the reason that that your home is compromised, right? That's that's probably the worst thing we could have is like you know the reason that someone got hacked is because Lutron was the was the entry point, right? That's that's just bad for for us all around. Um, second is performance. We really find ourselves in a position where we can delight our customers by having performance that that feels like you're in the space you know through an app if i can connect my mobile app through lte to my smart home and have like 50 millisecond latencies before the lights come on that's pretty impressive and it really does make people feel that there's a quality difference in what we offer versus your your um, competition so we think about you know, performance but also in terms of scalability how do we handle kind of spiky loads and how do we give people around the world the consistent experience so how do we we ensure a consistent global deployment approach uh, availability you know we certainly have to make sure that your lights always work right so if you're in your home and you touch the light switch it's going to work whether it's you know a smart home system or not secondarily we want to make sure that if you're in your home with your app it's always going to work so if you're in your home and your internet's out it'll work 
if your in your home internet's on, it'll work. Availability has been a huge uh, deal for us. So we have a lot of focus on continuous monitoring uh, and, and again, global deployment again here in the sense that we wanna make sure that, that the, the systems are available to you wherever you are in the world and that they're gonna be reliable for you. Um, in terms of reliability, you know, again, it kind of fits with availability, but we want to make sure that systems always work the way our customers expect, right? We don't want uh, a, a, a bad experience through the app or through our third-party integrations, which just makes the system, you know, much less smart for the end user. And finally, privacy. Um, it is our company policy that we do not sell your data. We do not make money off your data. Um, the only use cases we have for your data are basically to improve our products, and we make sure that's sort of front and center of how we develop our our systems. So again, very, very risk averse with, uh, you know, possible misuse of customer data. So let's talk a bit about security and then we're gonna jump into our development process and what we're, the technology stack we're using. Um, so I think security is really interesting in the case, of, in, the, in the world of IoT and in smart homes especially, because again, there's so many products out there that are really not secure, right? You have a ton of, of really cool ideas, some that you probably don't need, but you know, some really cool ideas about how you can kind of, you know, internet connect all sorts of devices. But as soon as you find out that, that your data has been compromised through that device, it, it really just feels nasty, right? So, you know, we, we really have put a lot of thought into security and we have a lot of ongoing work around our cloud, especially to ensure our security is, is front and center. You know, why do we care about that? Well, above and beyond, you know, the fact that anything goes in someone's home should be, you know, focused on security. You know, lighting provides safety and comfort. Um, if our marketing is that our system makes you more comfortable in your home, well, it's certainly not comfortable to have someone, you know, hack into your system. Um, if our lighting provides safety, you know, think about a commercial building. Um, there are all sorts of, of, of safety codes about lighting levels in stairways, you know, the, the ability to turn lights on and off in a very certain time frame, the ability to, to never turn lights off in certain spaces that are, you know, safety critical. We don't want that to be compromised through, through a third-party attacker. Um, you know, additionally, lighting's pervasive throughout your home. It's everywhere, right? What I actually find is a lot of our smart home users, especially the high end of the market, um, when you look at kind of the integration tools and systems like, like Josh AI I mentioned before, or some of the other systems like Crestron, one of the first things they'll do when they set up that whole home automation is to reach into our system as a third party kind of partner and pull out information that they can use to set up the entire home because we have sort of a, a, a floor plan of everything, right? You don't have any rooms that don't have lighting in them. Now you might not might not have smart lighting in every room, but in general, if you're building a smart home, you have lighting everywhere that you can tap into and understand. And so with that, of course, the configuration and setup of your lighting can hold personal data, right? So if I lay out my home and I I call my son's bedroom Teddy's bedroom, well, now that's I mean it's not it's not PII, but it's certainly personal, right? Knowing my family's names, knowing kind of my home layout, that could feel again pretty, pretty nasty if someone gets a hold of that, right? So again, we want to protect that. Um, and again, while, while there are plenty of insecure IoT devices out there, we want to make sure that we're not one of those. You know, we want to basically build a system our customers can trust. Um, so with that, we have a couple of kind of key ground rules that I keep in mind whenever I look at our system designs and how we're approaching uh, these, these connected systems. You know, one is never be the reason a cyber attacker gets in your home, right? You know, we try to be reasonable with our systems. We don't want to make it hard for the users to use. We're not trying to put up barriers uh, to entry. You know, so there are certain things we'll let you do. Like, you know, if you have an app and you you get yourself locked out of your account, there's some push button processes you could use on your on your little bridge device to get yourself back into the into the mix, right? Sure, if someone breaks in your home, they could probably push button the same way. That that is a risk we're willing to take, right? That's not a cyber attack. That's a physical you know penetration attack. Um, but in general, don't be the reason that a cyber attacker gets in your home. Second. Um, have a layered protection approach. Don't um, don't have the kind of crunchy exterior, chewy interior design to the architecture. If you get in one layer, have another layer you have to get into, right? Don't don't give kind of full access once you're inside the cluster. And then lastly, be extremely careful with access to our customer systems and data. So if there's anything that lets you control uh, a system or anything that lets you access a customer's information, those should be even more strongly uh, looked at. So securing our connections. So I'm going to dig in a little bit more to these, these individual connections and how we, how we do it. So let's first talk about, you know, the out-of-boxing. So when, we, when you buy a device from Lutron and you put it on your, your local router, uh, the first thing it's going to do is in the out-of-box process is try to provision itself on our cloud. Um, and this is the case for all of our Resi devices. This isn't the case for all of our commercial devices because there are cases we don't th want those on the internet. But for our Resi devices, these, this is basically the, the process you'll see. Um, it will basically reach out to an endpoint that we have that's well-defined. Uh, it will, using MTLS channel, basically set up a, a channel 
uh, MCLs with the cloud using device certificate and basically start doing the communication with the cloud over that secure channel where it'll be basically told how to connect to the MQTT broker, right? So basically that, that first channel is just to tell it how to connect and, and what the connection structure should look like. Um, that data is returned and then the, the, the device can now use that um, that information to go connect into the IoT cloud. Now we use Amazon uh, Web Services and their IoT core, and I'll get to that in a little more detail, but basically that's the technology stack we're on. So that, that credentialing is using the Amazon's you know, um, broker certificate process. And so once you have that broker certificate, you can now get data to and from our cloud. On the app side, uh, the first thing you have to do is you create an account with us and then you have to log in. The mobile app uses an OAuth 2 protocol to log in. And then the app then provisions itself on our cloud uh, using an OAuth 2 plus uh, CSR uh, approach. It is then also given um, an IoT broker certificate to work over MQTT, but those certificates are actually tied one-to-one -one between the mobile, the mobile app itself and the specific system or bridge that it's allowed to talk to. So we are basically ensuring we create individual channels over the MQTT backplane that allows us to secure the channel between one app and one system, one device, uh, you know, one smart home. So if you're a very rich person and you have multiple smart homes, uh, you can control them through the app. We'll see a list of smart homes, but each certificate that's generated will only control one. And so in our app, we manage that, that access pattern. So again, a lot of focus on on the one-to-one -one pairing of an app to a trusted a trusted app to a trusted system, and those channels again, uh, it's that same type of channel structure is used to be able to control that device through the cloud endpoint in general. So there's another channel created that's for cloud communications that is again secured um, at the the cloud layer above. Now, third-party integrations uh, generally are going to come into the system via OAuth uh, uh, protocols, OAuth authentication. So if you want to connect to Alexa, you go and and start basically pairing your accounts like you kind of probably have seen if you've ever paired Alexa with any other account. Uh, you basically go out, up to their app, you you install the skill, um, it'll start work, walking through this 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 process of, of joining your accounts. And basically what we're gonna do is generate a no auth grant for that for that integration. It'll have uh, the, the authorization from you and you can always be revoked through, through our app or through the other app to remove that. And basically that channel will then identify that third party integration as you as a user and allows that you then to connect to your system. Um, again, very, a lot of focus on ensuring that that's you know one-to-one -one mapping between that, that uh, authorized third party integration with your specific account on the other side down to your specific system. Now within the cloud itself, uh, we run all of our services as uh, Golang microservices on Kubernetes. And um, uh, we basically have an MTLS protocol between all of them. We use Istio for, so all the communications within the, that cluster are also secured, um, again, via MTLS, so that we have sort of a trusted certificate-based auth between all traffic on the, on the system. And we put a lot of focus on, you know, having a really a strong security model to ensure that, you know, first, only connected we're only going to connect trusted devices to our cloud, right? The IoT devices in our in our apps. Uh, we we wanted to make sure we didn't have this chewy center idea of like you know one hard outer shell you know at the gateway level and then you know a, a more chewy interior in case we made a mistake at the exterior level we'd have some protection. Um, really heavily leverage OAuth because that's going to give us that that ability to track the integration as a user, and um, you know within that OAuth. Uh, um, Flow, we also then do a lot of that. Uh, as you can imagine, we have different OAuth scopes for different integrations based on what they need to know. So we're trying to limit access and limit data flow as much as possible. Okay, so we talked about security. The second major architectural consideration was performance. And I just wanna talk about what's good enough. And, and there's probably a couple answers here. It's not that there's uh, one number that's the be all end all, but what we really wanna do is provide light switched level of performance through an internet connected device, right? The mobile app, if I'm sitting in my house and I'm connected to LTE and not in my local Wi-Fi, I really want to have the light come on. It wants to be perceived that the light came on as soon as I hit the button, right? That the instantaneous feel. You know, as such, we're saying, you know, for that type of interaction, like 50 milliseconds is kind of what we want. That's really perception-wise going to look instantaneous. And, and we've been able to reach that. So we actually do have uh, some benchmarks we're trying to hit, you know, for that performance, right? But let's consider what the overall context is here, right? We have very, we'll say it's very spiky client traffic. And um, it, it's interesting because think about why that would be. Well, uh, think about the time zone you're in and how many people are waking up at the same time as you? How many people go to work at the same time as you? How many people, you know, has set an alarm for 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or 6 a.m.? A lot of what we find is people have very, you know, 
rigid patterns of life and they tend to do things the same time every day, either because they have scheduled events, like turn the lights on when I wake up, uh, or because the first thing they do when they wake up is turn on the lights, right? Those kind of go hand in hand. And so we actually have some really interesting traffic patterns where the traffic itself is you know, always pretty, pretty high, but you have these very clear spikes. So we have to keep that in mind as we're thinking about performance. And we want to consider that, you know, this has to be done in a way that optimizes our, our cloud costs as well. Because quite frankly, you know, end of the day, we still sell hardware. Hardware pays our bills. Um, and uh, if we make our cloud costs too high, then we're not going to be as profitable as we want to be, which hurts our ability to build new products. So, you know, keeping our costs in line has been, definitely been a focus as well. You know, not necessarily at, at uh, we're not going to lose performance over that, but we want to make sure we're being cognizant of how we keep those costs in line. And so really at the end of the day, we need to ensure we can efficiently and quickly and, and ideally predictively scale our infrastructure to handle those loads. So imagine that our goal is, you know, mobile app to lights on 50 milliseconds or less is kind of our goal. And then, you know, Alexa command to lights on it could be a little longer because obviously there's, there's things outside of control there. But basically once it's our cloud, the goal would be, you know, sub 100 milliseconds or, or less. So let's talk about what the load looks like in that, in that case. So, cause that's also one part of this, you know, what's the load and what's the performance on that load. So each system that we sell can have dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of what we call end devices, dimmers, switches, sensors. Uh, now in a house like mine, um, 50 is probably a appropriate number, right? Where think about every switch in every light switch in your house, uh, how many control points do you have? You know, it sounds about right. Some of the really high-end homes we build in our homework system um, might have thousands of, of end devices, especially when you get to those Ketra systems where each bulb is addressable individually. That gets to be a very large number. Um, and for every, uh, what we kind of saw metrics-wise, this is a rough, rough estimate, but for every 100,000 home systems on our network, we see something around 50 million messages per day. Right, which is is a lot, but not a lot. Right, it's it's, it's decent traffic, but it's not crazy traffic. Um, but that traffic's really spiky. So this this chart here is um, it, it's bucketed out a little bit, but basically this is this is representative of what we see in real life. Um, you have this uh, a spiky behavior on morning and early evening. Uh, people wake up. They have timed events that trigger. Those timed events might be um, sunrise based or might be uh, just you know alarms essentially, right? Where they want to have the lights come on gradually as they wake up. And um, this is bucketed by hour, so you can kind of see seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. You know, it's, it's heavy, then it falls off, and then comes back up around the end of the day. But it's actually really interesting if you break this down by the minute. The spikes are really a minute long, right? Because think about it: if you have an alarm set for seven a.m. It's not set for 701, it's set for seven, right? Um, now, of course, there are things we can do in, into our, in our bridges to smooth that out a little bit. Like they don't have to all come out at seven o'clock on the second, but you also don't want your lights to come on a minute or two late because that feels like you've done something wrong, right? And so, so we do dither a bit on the, on the device, but it's, it's in the second or two in either, either side of our, of our you know, uh, event. Um, so again, you see these really heavy spikes on, on like the top of the hour or the 30 minute mark of the hour you know, and so forth. So that's a really interesting kind of piece of the, of the puzzle here is that we, we don't want to over provision, right? But we also want to make sure we hit those peaks um, that, that we have. And what's really critical I think to also understand is that this, this peak is very short lived. And so if we want to provide this really highly responsive um, uh, capability, uh, those big spikes, you can't wait for a, a traditional kind of spin up of a, of a node in a cluster, right? It might take a couple minutes for the node to spin up. Well, this is happening within a couple seconds. And so predictive scaling is much more important for us where we could spin up more nodes on a schedule based on what we learned from our data. Now, this talk is primarily about the residential smart home side of things, but we, we build one cloud for all of our systems, right? We don't want to build a separate cloud for commercial um, and, and we want to have those requirements kind of in one place. And so, it's important to note what type of impact the commercial projects have as well. And actually it's a pretty big impact because what we find is that while the number, the total number of connected systems in that space is lower, uh, the, the typical system will generate between 10 and hundred times more data per day than a residential system. You know, why is that? Well, the two big things that happen in commercial buildings that are, are very prominent that are much less prominent in a home is occupancy based, um, data, people walk through a space and we have occupancy sensors that turn on and off lights. That triggering of occupancy data is, is important and it's uh, gonna be high volume in, in very high traffic spaces. And you have what's called sunlighting data. So if we have, we have a system that's called um, Hyperion, which controls shades, and those shades are being controlled automatically based on where you are in the world, uh, what time of year it is, what time of day it is, but also then takes in sunlighting data to basically assure you're not getting any glare while optimizing 
natural light in your space. The idea is that if you could use more natural light, you spend less on on electric light, um, and you want to do so in a way that doesn't reduce the the quality of of um, work for folks who are sitting in your window. Um, that data, again, think about a cloud kind of passing by a big glass office building. That's going to generate a lot of data. And so that's a lot of stuff that's going to drive this stuff, this traffic. But at the same time, those users want that data, right? Because I want to be able to do reporting and analysis for them that helps them understand their space utilization, um, helps them understand how they're saving power because of sunlighting, right? Because they're going to be applying for, um, for you know, rebates from Pico, for example, right? So that's actually critical data, even though it's very high volume. So that's what's going to drive that change. So again, that's part of our architectural decision making here and how we approach our platform. So okay, just to recap, before we dig into the next, the next, all the slides I promise are all about software development and how we do it. Uh, so, what's the overall impact of all the stuff we talked about? You know, one is we want light switch level performance. Second, we want the flexibility to integrate securely with an ever evolving list of partners. Third, we want to efficiently and quickly scale our infrastructure to handle very spiky loads. Fourth, we need to be able to handle both residential and commercial data loads effectively and efficiently. And then finally, we want to optimize our performance against cloud costs so that we don't, you know, waste all of our company's profits. Okay. Okay. So how do we do it? So let's talk about major technologies first. Um, so center to this whole thing is we are on, we are deploying our IoT cloud on Amazon Web Services. Uh, we, we chose AWS uh, after a fairly uh, detailed trade study. Uh, we'll get into all the details, but basically we found that for the IoT capabilities, they were they were offering something unique, um, and that the, something unique that we wanted uh, let us have a, a what we saw as a more responsive, more capable, uh, higher performance, and a more secure offering than we think than we think we would have gotten elsewhere. Um, Riding on top of that, uh, kind of in that in that stack, the, one of the core technologies we care about is the specifically the Amazon IoT MQTT broker, which is part of their IoT core capability uh, managed service. And um, all of our our services that we write then uh, that are in anything that's performance critical are are running in a Kubernetes stack on top of AWS in their EKS uh, managed service. Uh, all the pods we're writing, all the all the services we're writing are in GoLang. Um, we we chose that for various reasons, uh, but but certainly not least of which is that it's it's really good at at you know handling kind of large volumes of parallel traffic. Um, within that Kubernetes cluster, we're also using Istio specifically um, to to simplify the interconnectivity, the secure interconnectivity between our services. We're not using all the features Istio offers, but we are using a lot of the, the communications um, channel management stuff there. Uh, we're heavily leveraging New Relic to monitor our applications and and um, alert us when anything's go anything goes awry. And then on the bottom, we are super into uh, continuous integration de deployment and specifically infrastructure as code. Um, everything we deploy is infrastructure as code. And I am a huge fan right now of Amazon CDK. And we're basically ensuring everything we push out is, is CDKified so we can easily skip, spin up a new copy of our environment. Um, and so technology wise, you know, we have a pretty, pretty, um, I'll say typical, you know, modern stack, if you will, on, on in terms of cloud deployments, but we're finding some great capabilities in the stack. Um, again, super excited about CDK, uh, super uh, happy so far with our, our experience with uh, AWS IoT. And, um, you know, overall Kubernetes, I think anyone who supports with it probably knows there's a lot of growing pains when you first get onto it, but once you have it working, once you have it kind of set up, uh, there's a lot of, you know, great benefits that it brings, which is why folks like to use it. I'm going to dig into each of these a bit more, but, uh, but just want to kind of highlight the technology stack we use. So let's dig in a bit on the, the um, IoT core side. Basically our, you know, this is really high level view, but the way we kind of think about our, our deployment is that we have uh, our managed Kubernetes cluster, which is gonna be where all the real workhorses live for our IoT system. It, it's connecting with the IoT device broker, which is the managed service from Amazon. And we have basically two classes of, of pods you know, that we, we work with. One is our API gateway. So we've, we've um, separated out the API gateway pods, which are living within, um, our Kubernetes cluster from the other workers that do the back end work. So we kind of separate the public facing stuff from the from the internal workings. Um, and those API gateway nodes are running essentially Nginx uh, uh, configured to work with Istio and, and Kubernetes. Um, this is all sitting behind a load balancer, which Amazon provides. It's a, a network load balancer. And basically, you know, these are all accessible at something like, you know, API dot, you know, Lutron dot IO or something like that, right? API dot IOT dot Lutron dot IO. Um, Traffic comes into the gateways, they get routed to the appropriate workers, and then those workers you know, you know, do their job, communicate with the devices, and so forth. We do have some things over in Lambdas as well. Basically, anything that's not performance critical, that is sort of a, a, a 
support function. Um, so data collection, data processing type of things. And then we also have a data analytics environment, which is uh, capturing some of the data for analytic purposes. Again, not personal data, just you know, generally, you know, connectivity data, um, um, so forth. That comes in through uh, a very, again, very traditional uh, data science pipeline, uh, data engineering pipeline with an Amazon, uh, you know, Kinesis Firehost, S3, goes through a glue pipeline into uh, another S3 bucket, which is then overlaid with Athena. Now, kind of getting one more layer deep, you know, why did we kind of pick EKS to run our Kubernetes cluster and what did we get out of it? So overall, um, we picked it because we wanted not to worry about hardware, right? We want to be able to just think about the, the logical deployments. And, and you're seeing here is just a basic view of how we've deployed. So within um, for those that are Amazon kind of savvy, we have our VPC. Uh, inside that VPC, we have typically three or more availability zones um, and you have a VPC per uh, per region, right? So per, per uh, deployed region. Um, we have a public subnet in each one that only thing it hosts is the NLB um, and everything else is in a private subnet, which, which has very tight uh, security groups around it, um, including the Nginx uh, uh, workers. They could be in the private subnet because they're tapped in with a, a, a single rule, essentially allowing traffic from the NLB to the Nginx over port 443. Uh, then those talk to all the workers via Istio and then respond as appropriately. So we've, we found this uh, very, uh, uh, good for us in terms of the performance and the overall uh, deployment path. What's really nice is that the way we set it up now is that this can be deployed in many regions around the world in the exact same footprint. Um, just kind of pop it out there and, and you're good to go. Um, next up, I'm going to kind of touch on a couple of things here uh, before kind of uh, digging in for some questions. But uh, we, we, we really wanted to put some focus on repeatability, um, monitoring, and how we kind of manage our infrastructure. And so, you know, that Kubernetes cluster is, is sort of critical, that's where everything runs, but how do we get it set up and, and managed? Um, we really took an approach of, of, of applying three technologies here to do this. You know, one is um, Amazon CDK, basically repeatable infrastructure as code. Um, we started with CloudFormation, but as CDK rolled out, we saw it was much, much better for us to manage it as, you know, basically manage our infrastructure as Python code rather than as um, YAML. And so we've really shifted over to that CDK as our primary uh, way of doing things. Um, and that helps us kind of get uh, a solid repeatable infrastructure across all of our environments. Second, um, I've been requiring, and I think for, for good, good value uh, that all of our APIs are, are well documented for our integration partners in OpenAPI and Swagger. And that's been, we've been able to use that to help uh, really, you know, drive out some automation, some testing, some, some data model generation and so forth from that as well. Uh, and then every service we deploy is integrated natively to New Relic. Uh, we basically, we, we provided sort of a foundational layer in our Golang environment to basically ensure all of our logging gets appropriately put into CloudWatch, into New Relic and so forth based on the type of log it is. And that's given us nice insights. We have insights at kind of build time. We know that all of our environments match. We have insights at design time because of the, the open API spec and knowing how our APIs should work. And we have insights at runtime because of the new Relic integrations. So uh, for those that don't know it, I'm just going to get a quick highlight here and spend a little more time on CDK than the rest. But open API is a, a language for specifying APIs. Uh, so if you're doing REST APIs, think of it as a great way to document your API in a, in a really actionable format. Um, it's YAML based. Uh, it allows for auto generation of code, specifically data objects and endpoint routing. Um, and it really more than anything else provides a clear contract between producers and consumers. It's really unambiguous and, and very well documented. So we use that to document every endpoint we have, including security models. Now with CDK, this is one I'm going to spend a little more time on. And I see that someone did ask about code rollouts. So I'm just going to uh, talk about that a little bit too here. So we, we decided that everything in our infrastructure will be done through uh, infrastructure as code early on. You know, nothing hand jammed, nothing generated through the console. And so CDK has been uh, really awesome, honestly. Uh, CloudFormation is fine. You know, it is, it's, it's hard to write, but it, it works. But CDK takes that kind of one step further and gives you the ability to write in a natural, uh, a natural um, way. Um, so in this case, this is just a really simple example. It's actually pretty much taken right out of one of our our CDK stacks. Uh, in this case, I'm building out a Dynamo table to store some status data. I'm building out a, a, a Lambda function to uh, pull that from IoT core. I'm putting out a Lambda function to offer up an HTTP REST endpoint. And I'm granting read and 
write access appropriately to those lambdas to that Dynamo table. And you see it's like very concise to basically create these, these things. But what we actually found is, is this goes a little bit beyond just being able to get consistency across environments. We've set up our environment so that now when you build, uh, we basically automatically, if you're in a feature branch and, you know, and you're building through Jenkins, it will start tagging things with your own feature branch so you can basically have your own stack created and not trample on each other as you're working together in, in the environment. So you can almost get a, a whole environment spun up for yourself on the fly uh, just by building your, your feature branch and selecting deploy yes. Um, it'll build everything you touch, everything you change. It'll be isolated to you. And then when you merge back to develop and then up to master, those things kind of merge back in and get cleaned up. Um, so again, I can't say enough good things about CDK. And, and this is a big part of how we're doing our overall rollout. So what we basically do is you think about you know, any standard kind of Git structure. We have a master, a develop, and then feature branches kind of below that. Uh, feature branches can be deployed to our sandbox, and, and developers can do that themselves through Jenkins' uh, job. Um, and uh, we don't auto deploy them to the sandbox. We have to go in and actually say deploy yes, just to make it you know, a little bit cleaner in terms of that process. Um, but then once you merge to develop, uh, that's automatically going to trigger a build where we're going to kind of update our QA environment, update our, our secondary environments and so forth, and ensure everything's kind of merged in the right way and have a running copy of what you have. And then again, on build to master, everything again builds out the same way. So first thing we do is deploy the infrastructure, the platform, and that's going to be all CDK and CloudFormation based. Uh, then we essentially auto build uh, and, and then auto deploy our, our new uh, services, our new containers. So all of our services get packaged up into a Docker container. They get pushed to our factory and then get, uh, we do that mostly for internal auditing and, and kind of tracking. And then we push them from our factory into ECR in the target environment where we then update the, uh, the, the cluster based on a, a rolling kind of uh, strategy. Uh, what, what we basically do with this a lot of times is, um, for code rollouts, it really depends if it's a breaking change or not breaking change, right? If your interface changes or not. Um, way we've set it up is basically uh, because it's Kubernetes in any case, you could set up basically a policy of when you roll your pods. Uh, we could basically set up a new um, artifact in our ECR. And the next time that pod rolls, it'll pick the new version. And you can do it in a policy where it's kind of rolling every so often and just picking those up. So we have a pretty good way of, of keeping those things kind of continuously rolling. Now, of course, if that if there's an interface change or some data change, that's a we we're a bit more careful about that, right? It's not just gonna be automatic in that way, but we have a couple strategies around that where based on what type of breaking change it is, how are we gonna deploy them out? Do we deploy them as like parallel containers? Do we deploy them as like parallel uh, jobs? But in general, if we're talking about non-breaking changes, it's kind of a, a sprint to sprint release. Um, we have the auto build process that triggers on the merge to master. It builds the Docker containers. The Docker containers get pushed to ECR. And then basically based on our, our policy, those containers will roll every so often and pick up the latest uh, container we, we have. Um, and then kind of going back to uh, going back to application performance, again, New Relic's been, been been great as well. Can't say enough good things about it. Um, I guess the only thing I could you know, hope for is it was a little cheaper, but you know, <laughs> good tools cost money for a reason. Uh, it saved us a ton of time and effort, so it's been worth every penny. Um, so application performance monitoring tools, you know, basically let us instrument our code simply and gain real-time insights into the system performance, right? So we, we use this heavily, so we have, um, a whole bunch of, of metrics we track through New Relic. We get reports daily, um, alerts, if anything crosses the threshold of performance or error. Uh, we have a number of synthetic transactions we send through the system just to try to make sure we're keeping track of how the system's doing. And basically, anytime we see a spike, we get, you know, a number of us get emailed and and, and texted to let us know that something's out of, out of whack, right? So um, we've been this part of the foundation of our platform that every service we build um, natively gets integrated into New Relic by using our logging library. And so we get those insights without having to have the developers do much extra work, which has been, again, very, very nice. So I'm going to take a pause here uh, to kind of talk about some of the technology in the stacks. Uh, I'm going to let you know that we are you know, always hiring, though, of course, it's a little weird now with uh, the virtual interviews. I think we're going to try to get them honed up a little bit over the next few weeks and restart them in a couple weeks. But we're hiring application software engineers, embedded software engineers, data scientists, data engineers. Uh, certainly, Philadelphia is a great office. We have offices in Philadelphia. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful office in the FMC Tower. Uh, Coopersburg, PA, where our headquarters is, that's uh, up in uh, Allentown area. Uh, we have offices also in Boynton Beach, Florida, um, Boston, Mass, and Austin, Texas. Um, and so, you know, feel free to peruse our career site or reach out to me via, via um, uh, Slack here or whatever. Um, but why don't we take a pause and maybe, uh, Jack, do you want to take some questions from the, uh, from the Slack channel? Absolutely. I, uh, my green screen did not make it to, to the end of the final presentation. So uh, I think there's currently only uh, one more question. Dave Taylor asks, uh, do you use HTTP2? 
Sure. So actually, we, we do not right now. So we, we, when we first implemented the platform, we had two protocols we supported for everything. One was gRPC, which technically is on HTTP2, uh, but it's packaged up a little bit, little bit differently. And then we had our standard HTTP path. Uh, what we found was that we did that basically because we wanted a, a higher speed option uh, for internal communication specifically, where we'd have service, service calls go over that channel. Um, what we found is that we, we still we got great performance out of our, our standard HTTP path, so we, we just didn't see a reason to keep that around. So we've uh, basically turned that off, uh, though we did we did explore it and we kind of keep an eye out for it. So that's an option for us to turn back on if we see a performance benefit. But basically, we, we started that way and, and it wasn't different enough. Um, the speeds were very similar. And so we said, you know, it's adding complexity to our, our management to have two interfaces. Uh, let's not bother. And so we, we haven't pursued that further. If anybody else has a question, um, feel free to type it in now. And if not, then uh, we can wrap things up. Thank you so much for this. This was crazy interesting. Uh, I think as this, as Kevin McAllister mentioned in the in the comments, yeah, like a one, one minute peak time of usage is kind of things that you know I'd certainly never considered. That's, it would that's, be an issue. I think that's what's actually fun about it is that you know I, I worked. Um, I, I worked with uh, uh, satellites for a long time. And so, you know, I always got to say, oh, I work with space stuff. And it's kind of cool, right? It sounds good. You say, I'm going to work with light switches. It doesn't sound quite as cool, right? It doesn't <laughs> kind of roll off the tongue the same way. But the, the tech challenge are actually really crazy interesting. And the, the team has been, is great. Um, so the technology stack's been fun. The tech stack's great. Um, I do see a question here from Dave following up saying, would you start with HTTP2 if no prior tech? So the short answer is, is no, but the reason I say no, but is that one of the primary things we're building for is our third party integrators. And I, I think most of them that we work with are more comfortable so far, even, you know, not everyone's an Amazon or Google, right? So, so I can give them kind of a more traditional HTTP REST endpoint and they'll pretty much know how to use it. Um, and so since there are primary customers that integrate with our endpoints, I would start with that because of that requirement, you know, from a, from a speed and, and ease of use, I love gRPC and HTTP2, I think they're a great technology for the internal to the stack. And if I didn't need to maintain that, that externally facing third party kind of perspective, maybe I would. But I think given our, our set of users who interact with us, I probably, I probably wouldn't only do that. Um, you know, internally, we, we saw some early potential of doing that because it, it was going to be higher performance and it, it was measured at higher performance. It just wasn't enough different to, to, val to validate the engineering time we were spending to keep both channels available. Yeah, so feel free if you guys are interested in Lutron, reach out. Uh, always, always looking to hire great people. Uh, Philadelphia is a great office. Uh, a lot of great tech going on down there. All of our, uh, all of our kind of the Philly office is all software. Uh, doing our IoT cloud, our application level embedded software, uh, data science, and mobile apps, um, as well as UX. So uh, some really great, great teams down there. Plus, I'm there. <laughs> and for the folks, I do see that uh, someone mentioned they still have. Uh, some some uh, rotary style dimmers at their house. I mean, actually, I did too. I moved in too. I, until I put my my Cassata in, I have them too. Um, they're actually still still workhorses, so you can still buy them. We still uh, we still sell plenty. All right, I feel like we're probably good to wrap it up now. Uh, Chris, thank you again so much. I I can't. Oh, we did get one more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Richard Faber asked uh, database databases used. Uh, you mentioned Dynamo. Oh sure. Learned about others. Yeah, we, we do a lot of Dynamo. Uh, Dynamo has been good for a lot of what we're doing because it is that, you know, kind of uh, uh, very high speed, kind of responsive at scale kind of kind of structure. So uh, we use Dynamo, we use Postgres uh, in RDS. Those are the two most prominent within this platform. Um, uh, we have some other databases kind of scattered around our legacy systems that we are kind of moving off of, but basically it's gonna be Postgres and RDS and, and Dynamo based on what the use case is. Uh, Dynamo for anything is gonna be sort of highly kind of critical in terms of response times. You know, so I, you know, some some services I require to have response in say 10 milliseconds or less, those are primarily in Dynamo. But we have some data that's very relational in nature, so we still keep it in Postgres and and, and RDS has been good for that. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to everybody out there watching who's been watching, uh, couldn't appreciate this more, so. Thank you, everybody, for a great ETE. Thank you, Christopher, for honestly a mind-blowing talk that did <laughs> did teach me some stuff there. So cool. thank you so much. Thanks, folks. Appreciate it.